Good morning and thank you very much for having me in Huddersfield. As you can observe, I'm here to present Bob Dylan's iconic performance activity and performance in 1960s American culture. This paper will consider Bob Dylan's rupture with the two dominant models of male identity and so folklore between 1962 and 1966, a decisive period in his career. Not just an innovator in the musical field, Dylan also acted as a catalyst in terms of presenting a renewed conception of masculinity that offer alternatives to the ideals which were widely endorsed in American society. In order to reinforce the statement of my research, I will point out the significance of Dylan's presence in popular culture in, in contrast with two American male icons of the 50s, James Dean's in, in, Rebel, in Rebel Without a Cause and Jack Kerouac in On the Road. Following up with his chameleonic-like transformation in a period of four years, I will refer to Theodore Rosak's seminal work, The Making of the Counterculture, as it illustrates the main pillars that compounded the birth and development of the countercultural movement of which Dylan was a reluctant leader. In the last place, I will make a direct remark on Todd Haynes' I'm not there, considering that it features six incarnations of Dylan that reflect about both the evolution of his masculinity and the use and the use of masks that hidden the real identity that exists behind the public persona. The, the, the 50s and 60s were primarily affected both by the effects of World War II and the historical development of Cold War, a period that inevitably led to the nuclear arms race as well as into the growth of the American economy. In consequence, two predominant paradigms which characterize these decades both in the US and England were the soldier and the figure of breadwinner. Respecting the warrior, the main reason that turned the image of this man into a role model for society was historical, and I quote, the soldier becomes the embodiment of the need for the state to construct a rough or violent masculinity in the defense or protection of Great Britain and the waging of the Cold War. On the other hand, the figure of breadwinner surfaced due to the interest of the state in preserving the predominance of ideologically sanctioned productive masculinity that meant the preservation of canonical values and the defense of any kind of threat that challenged such hegemonic position, as Baker state next. The domestic breadwinner is then a strong masculinity produced to withstand feminization and communism, and the nationwide works hard to maintain it. Besides the negative consequences that, he, that the historical background exerted in the construction of the soldier archetype, we must emphasize that the effects that the World War II had on those fighters who, after coming back home, developed new behaviors with regards to their personal relationships. This can be ascribed to three reasons, the trauma they experienced in the battle, their inability to recover, or an inability to find their own place in a restructured society that has evolved significantly. Therefore, post-war American patriarchy's insistence on figures of the soldier and the breadwinner as the new and only valid and great interpretations of a masculinity had severe consequences. This imposition denied any kind of individual's development as a human being. In case of the fighter, his main function was serving to the needs of a specific group. Respecting the breadwinner, his principal role was to maintain the whole family both at the economical and emotional level. A fact that contributed, contributed to strengthening the worth of the crisis which was already inherent in the individual. I quote, there was the family man, content with house and garden, and there was the old wartime hero who put freedom before family and loved ones. In this way, a contradiction, a conflict at the heart of the construction of masculinity which was reflected in a series of texts of their, over the 1950s, among which stands out Robert Bloch's side quote. Nicholas Ray Rebel Without a Cause came out in theatres in 1955, a prosperous year which was mainly characterized for its classicism, conformity, and opulence. The script told the story of Jim Stark, a middle-class teenager who challenged the traditional values of his family with the aim of finding his own identity. A process of self-discovery that, that besides resulting outstanding to many spectators because of its arduousness, opened the path with respect that presentation of a series of the typical unexplored and fear masculinities which differed from the profile of the hegemonic ones, that is, outsiders, hipsters, artists, homosexuals, and so on. In Claudia Springer's words, 
The rebel figure was a crucial component in the creation of new masculine styles that revealed vulnerability and confusion, and suggested that masculinity was a culturally constructed category that arbitrarily imposed its strictures on men who did not easily fit. Like this, James Dean's striking performance on screen made such a, huge, uh, such a huge impression on Dylan's mind the night of its view that according to Bob Spreet's statement in Dylan, a biography, if ever the term born again applied to Bob Dylan, it was then. Following, his, this, following this celluloid revelation, he had gotten a glimpse of the future up on the screen in the form of James Dean, teenage rebel, and it appealed to his sensibility. In result, a new kind of performance based on the expression of feeling, posture, and attitude, which will be impersonated by Dylan himself in the Free Williams front cover. In the mid 40s, a marginal literary movement, denominated as the Big Generation, emerged in the US. The philosophy that characterized the lifestyle of this group of writers marked, marked a distinction with respect to the canonical system that ruled the society of the time. In consequence, their ideals turned into a great source of inspiration for many artists such as the Beatles, Patti Smith, and more specifically, Bob Dylan, who besides being considered against his consent as, as an indisputable leader of the American content culture, has admitted on many occasions the enormous effect it had on him. One of the most reliable proofs in this respect can be observed in Dylan's official autobiography, Chronicles Volume 1, a narration composed by a series of intimate flashbacks that explored firsthand his memories at the personal, historical, and professional levels. Moreover, it brings to light some of the innumerable masks that Dylan has portrayed throughout the years, the same ones which have contributed to give shape to an evolving, co an evolving concept of masculinity. In the first chapter of the book, Marking up the score, Dylan depicts, depicts himself as an ordinary jumpster, a wanderer for whom the road meant speed, freedom, and a process of continuous renewal. And I quote, I could trust them the limitations. It wasn't money or love that I was looking for. I had a heightened sense of awareness, was set in many ways, impractical and visionary to boot. My mind was strong like a trap and I didn't need any guarantee of validity. In this way, a determined attitude which was clearly influenced by the time he spent living in Greenwich Village, the Bohemian neighborhood of New York, whose atmosphere was inherently linked to the big generation as a result of the convergence between diverse cultural, political, and artistic ideas. In Dylan's own words, I suppose that what I was looking for was what I read about in On the Road, looking for the great city, looking for the speed, the sound of it, looking for what Allen Ginsberg had called the hydrogen jukebox world. Thus, an early devotion manifested in Chronicles that shortly after turned into a close relation with Allen Ginsberg, Candle Culture's prophet, and with whom Dylan would make multiple collaborations in the, new, in the fields of music, literature, and cinema. Between 1962 and 1966, <coughs> Bob Dylan released seven albums that, besides change in the course of music history, allowed him to offer an alternative to the two paradigms of American masculinity which had prevailed in popular culture until then. On March 19, 1962, Bob Dylan's first homonymous album presented a masculinity which was articulated in a set of performances that negotiated tradition, innovation, personal circumstances, and the political background of the 60s. In short, he was an outsider, a man who, despite having abandoned his rural origins, still turned to them in portions of both a personal and distinctive performance on stage. Bob Dylan's second, second album, The Free Willing, consolidated his, personal, his professional career as a songwriter and constituted one of the few times when it has been portrayed an in, intimate and unknown face of himself, his mask as a lover. In there, uh, there was a prominent difference in terms of narration. As it can be observed, Dylan doesn't appear alone, and there is a space to introduce someone else to the audience. In this case, a young woman called Suze Rotto, a liberal political activist, his girlfriend at that time, who would serve as a muse to the artist. On January 13, 19, 1964, Dylan released The Times Are Changing. This was the first time in his whole professional career when he recorded original songs with just an acoustic guitar and a harmonica. The fact that since the first line of the track, Dylan is actively encouraging the listeners to question themselves while considering the possibility of a revolution, 
made that many critics, fans, and journalists would praise him as the King Protest or the Prophet. On August 8, 1964, Dylan published another side of Bob Dylan, despite it has been rated by most critics as one of his worst albums. What it is undeniable is that it marked a transitional period towards maturity. In here, he projected the image of a reflective, relaxed person who was open to any kind of change after having known the price of fame. Therefore, a half-explorer, half-poet who would start being deeply influenced by the, by the emergence of psychedelia. On March 22, 1965, Dylan's uh, fifth album, Bringing It All Back Home, came out. His purpose was going a step forward in his professional career with the aim of experimenting with a new sound that would challenge his most traditional devotees. Photographer Kramer portrayed Dylan sitting forward, holding his cat, and surrounded by an enigmatic atmosphere while the bullseye level, the living colors, red and blue, and rooms decoration, the chimney, paintings, and sofas, were distinctive elements of the psychedelia. On August 30, 1965, Bob Dylan released his sixth album, Highway 61 Revisited. In its cover art, he wore a significant white t-shirt that showed a motorcycle logo, a detail that may act as a premonition of the crash accident he will have in 1966, and a clear evocation of Johnny, the central character of the movie The Wild One, played by Marlon Brando in 1953. The mask Bob Dylan wore in here portrayed him as a rebel icon, a motorcycle lover whose electrified sound broke barriers at all levels. Therefore, an image that reinforced the vision of his persona as a representative of the deep roots of America, but who was still looking for something which was missing in, in his life. On 16th May 1966, Bob Dylan released Blonde on Blonde, the first double LP in rock music, considered by most music experts as one of the greatest albums of all time, with international hits such as Just Like a Woman, I Want You, or Sad Eyed Lady of the Lowlands, Dylan achieved that thing, that white mercury sound, its metallic and bright gold with whatever that conjures up. Regarding the projection of masculinity he presented it in here, it stood out for showing up a grown-up image that didn't hesitate in showing up a sense of irritation, coldness, and distance to the observer. A gesture that made Dylan look older than his real age, he was only 25 at that time, and which reflected both the fatigue and the lack of comfort he was facing as a result of being considered as an international celebrity. The making of a counterculture examines the birth, the expansion, and consolidation of such an establishment movement in the United Kingdom first and the United States in the aftermath. As the author himself corroborates next, it was mainly characterized by a series of rebellious actions that, besides opposing to mainstream, led up its member to an innovative process of self-introspection. And I quote, everything was called into question, family, work, education, success, child rearing, male-female relations, sexuality, urbanism, science, technology, progress, the meaning of wealth, the meaning of love, the meaning of life, all became issues in need of examination. Bearing in mind that counterculture's principles were directly addressed to satisfy the expectations of those youthful spirits who aimed to create a better world free of barriers, the discipline of music itself, considered as a vehicle for cultural transmission, became its most effective means of interaction and expansion. And I quote, music inspired and carried the best insights of the counterculture for, from folk protest ballads and, song of, and songs of social significance at the outset to the acid rock that became the only way to reflect the surrealistic turn that America was to take at the climax of the Vietnam War. However, even though these artistic expressions arose with the, with the aim of defeating global injustices, just such as poverty, racism, and especially the capitalism which was caused by the establishment, and I quote, at first the culture of the young was nothing but merchandise, clothes, records, movies, cosmetics. The teenager was, inve was invented as a market. But the market dangerously intensified self-awareness in the adolescent years of life that most lend themselves to breathing introspection. Thus, an incongruity, which added to the lack of organization that characterized the, the development of counterculture throughout the whole decade, ended by the mid-70s. 
a moment often depicted by critics as a roundabout failure, which was preceded by the celebration of the Woodstock Music Festival in 1969, a historical event that gathered around 500,000 people and which was marked by two decisive facts. Milan's absence was a personal decision that served to reaffirm his opposition of being considered as a prophet or the leader of the movement, of the movement he never thought he had belonged to. In addition, Woodstock was the show where artists such as Janis Joplin or Jimi Hendrix consecrated themselves as myths of the same culture which would absorb them shortly after. And I quote, culture plays its part in the deception not as a mass considering social reality, but rather as a screen on which the psyche projects itself in a grand repertory of sublimations. Bob Dylan's biopic I'm Not There by Todd Haynes recreates several chapters in the life and music of the American singer-songwriter by featuring six incarnations of his own self that break with the linear filmmaking narrative structure. In far from constraining such remarkable performances, this underlines even more the similarities and differences that compound Dylan's diverse use of masks. As Robert Elbert, American film critic, states, We've seen, we've seen six gifted actors challenged by playing faces of a complete man. We've seen a daring attempt at biography as a collage. That is a series of pieces that compound the jigsaw puzzle and resist being fitted together, just like in the sleeve of self-portrait where Bob Dylan apparently depicts his persona. But in the end, uh, but in the end it just remains as another mask. Thus, this is an affirmation that may help us to reconsider questions about it and therefore accept that there remains a tension between the series of masks and the collage dealer. Todd Haynes corroborates these viewpoints when affirms. But what's so amazing about Dylan is that each of those transitions from character to character or self to self, which come with the death, the death is built in, is also a liberation into a new self, a new identity. I'm not their opening scene, is that his intelligent bet at giving the audience the chance of feeling themselves as the own Dylan on his way to the stage for a few seconds. Thus, through the labyrinth where he is loudly claimed, the inclusion of the motorbike is a clear symbol of the 1966 accident that allowed him killing off any previous conception around his persona. A period of eight years in which he remained out of the scene recording an incessant quantity of material in Big Bang, while displaying his most familiar side with, with his at that time wife Sarah and his four sons. Nevertheless, as a result of self-portrait uh, low sales in 1907, uh, many scholars and critics such as Gray Marcus mistakenly thought that the creation of peculiar albums like this one would prevent him safe, would prevent him having the same degree of relevance in popular music as he had got in the previous decade. So if we extrapolate this idea to the movie, we notice that we are symbolically attending to the assassination of the six most popular mask Dylan has worn throughout the years with the blow of gunshots. As the narrator himself describes next, there he lay poet, prophet, outlaw, fake, star of electricity. Without a doubt, a significant sequence that, when analyzed in detail, allows establishing a clear parallelism between the death of the artist, wonderfully interpreted by Kate Blanchett, who rests in the coffin, and Roland Barthes' Death of the Author, in which he writes, The author is a modern figure, produced no doubt by our society in so far as, at the end of the Middle Ages, with English empiricism, French rationalism, and the personal faith of the Reformation. It discovered the prestige of the individual, or to put it nobly, of the human person. In order to conclude this analysis, I will refer to one of Bob Dylan's most sincere confessions he offers in No Direction Home. As I believe it summarizes perfectly both the comprehension of his role as an artist and the reason why he has never stopped using masks throughout his whole career. And I quote, an artist has got to be careful never really to arrive at a place where he thinks he's at somewhere. You always have to realize that you are constantly in the state of becoming, you know? And as long as you can stay in that realm, you'll sort of be all right. So despite considering the fact that there can exist biographical or psychological reasons that reinforce the use of these masks, 
The key principle that summarizes the response to the question suggested above is the state of becoming. Because in terms of Bob Dylan, everything is about process, change, and fluidity. As he asserts in this question, he is always reinventing himself because he is never the same thing twice. Therefore, there is no real Bob Dylan. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Are there any questions? We have 10 minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so you talked a bit about uh, you know, the of Kerouac and, and being keen on Dylan. I was wondering, what are your thoughts on Dylan's influence on counterculture and nationality? Do you find any influence? Well, I think in that respect, he has always been a kind of sponge absorbing from so many different uh, sources, let's say. Um, Indisputably, I think he's always been renewing himself, as I've been asserting like, throughout the whole conference, but um, I think um, he, has the he has the power to be against himself, even though when he's uh, having lots of success, and that's one of the things I think that um, are in, in are, um, these are like some of the traces that can characterize the counterculture, being against the system, even though when you're quite successful and you found uh, uh, the formula and everyone is uh, claiming you and you are in the center of everything, even, even though you are not the one that everybody is thinking you are. Um, so I will say being against against himself, even though you found what's the formula formula to be successful. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Sarah, for that for that paper. Um, excuse me. I just wanted to make a couple of uh, comments or ask a question in a way. Um, have you come across that piece that uh, Kerouac wrote about uh, James Dean, Marvin Brown, and Elvis Presley? Um, it, it could could be useful to to mm -hmm. to, to your thing. It, it is called it's called America's New Trinity of Love, and it's interesting that you should bring Dean and Kerouac into play right at the very start. And Kerouac in I think it's fifty seven is writing an essay which sees in these three great icons of the period, um, a new kind of masculinity. And if, if you've not come across that yet, it may be yeah. useful to, to, to some of your uh, researchers. But, uh, um, I just wanted to ask, ask you about something else, though. Did you see those um, Pulp Fiction covers that I shared today? Um, Todd Alcott has turned Bob Dylan songs into Pulp Fiction artworks. They're, they're, they're fascinating. And I noticed one of the comments on Facebook was that the, the process that was going on reminded this person of, of I'm Not There. I couldn't quite work out what he was driving at there, but I, I suppose if, um, if Dylan's work is being adapted in that sort of intertextual way, um, Maybe there is some sort of identity uh, issue being played out. Would you would you would you agree with that? Or, I mean, I, I couldn't quite get, get, get a handle on it myself, but, but thought you might have a, an idea. I don't know. Yeah, um, thank you very much for suggesting me that piece of reading. I will go through it as soon as I'm back in Manchester. Um, regarding the question, um, yes, I mean. Um, Bob Dylan has been, and he's still like one of the most important figures in popular music. We all agree that. Um, the thing that he's been on stage for more than 50 years means that you can approach to this figure from so many different perspectives. Uh, if, if you're interested in literature, music, religion, politics, you can you can find plenty of different ways to approach to him. And as I've asserted before, I think. One of the best things about Dylan is that nobody really knows who's Dylan, but Dylan himself. Even though, even, even, even the name himself is a construction. And the thing that, in terms of identity, 
um, he, he has always been very successful in terms of uh, showing a side of himself and then making the others believe that it was what he was showing up in, in that moment and then coming backwards and then moving to a new direction. And that gives you lots of space uh, to create in your mind, um, to, to have like a kind of collage and to put like so many different sides of the same person or the same character, let's say, and then identify yourself with the one that it's uh, more suitable to you or the one that appeals you most. So, um, yeah, that's, I think that's a really good thing. I mean, in terms of identity, you can approach to him in so many different paths and ways that... I wonder if I could just try to tie those two questions together and ask, so, uh, regarding uh, countercultural masculinity and the beats, I mean, where does Allen Ginsberg fit into what you're doing? Um, as a fairly important figure in Dylan's career, really. As a prophet of counterculture, he wrote home. He was, yeah. It was like the first work, uh, it's considered as the main work in yeah. counterculture. Um, has been working both in literature and music. The relationship between Dylan and Ginsberg was very productive at all levels, not just in terms of his personal, their personal relationship, but also in their professional careers, because Dylan was making lots of collaborations with Ginsburg. Ginsburg was also making collaborations so with Dylan. Back there, in the <laughs> yeah, so there are homesick blues, and um, there's lots of material, even CDs available. Mm -hmm. So, um, Dylan, uh, sorry, I mean, how, how do you think that Ginsburg's um, creation of a new kind of masculinity or the openness with which he talked about sexuality might have influenced Dylan's own construction of himself. In how he's writing about like all those uh, masculinities which are like um, put like in, in, in one side, which are like um, marginalized in, in, in a way. And I can relate that to Dylan because in some ways he's also breaking up with uh, as I've said, with the two main masculinities, which were um, the dominant ones, um, in, in how he was speaking about homosexuals, hipsters, artists, you know, like, uh, I wasn't good, I mean, for like the canon, for mm -hmm. the system. And in a way, I think Dylan, he was, he was also um, someone who was defeating who was challenging the system because he was showing a different way to live, a different way to act, a different way to create art, and um, yeah, he was he was he was being like very influential to to all those. He was giving a voice to all those who didn't have this kind of space or didn't have this kind of chance to express who they were really. So to see. In your, so I assume this comes out of a larger project. So is this your PhD, part of your PhD? So are you looking at the, the many different literary influences on Dylan, or? I'm okay. working um, Dylan. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I focus myself just on 10 years, between 1956 and 1966. I'm dealing with different aspects. Um, that is masculinity, um, masculinity, a performance, use of masks, and then I've been um, analyzing um, the first seven albums he released between 1962 up to 1966. I decided to start 1956 because it was the time when Allen Ginsberg published Howl, and I thought it was a turning point. And then I, I will conclude 1966 after the motorcycle accident. So. I, mean, yes. I, I, I think that's the point that Shadow Race the Banks are. Uh, Ginsburg's importance. He, he's sometimes seen as a kind of father figure to Dylan. Yeah. But others have argued it's more like a, a brother figure because although they're, they're, they're born, um, I think, 14 years apart, Ginsburg's first important work only comes six years before Dylan's first important work in terms of the publication. And, uh, and, and, and that I, I've never really thought about it as much as perhaps I, I might have done, but 
What do you think Dylan made of um, Ginsburg's homosexual lifestyle? Do, 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 was he comfortable with that? I mean, he, has, has Dylan ever spoken about this? Um, if we talk about masculinity, you know, it's quite interesting. When I've been reading about, like, the relationship between both figures, what I found out was that Allen Ginsberg fell in love with Dylan. Yeah. He wasn't, it wasn't like something that, he wasn't correspond, cor corresponded by, yeah. by Dylan in that way because he was married and he had a big family. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of masculinity, I think both both are key figures in this aspect. I mean, in terms of counterculture and what it means to the others and to the future generations. I mean, if, if, if you go, um, if you do any kind of research on counterculture, these two figures are, are in there. And there's no question about that. Yeah. I'm sorry, I missed the start of your talk. Um, and thank you, it's really interesting. I was going to ask you, before you just explained your project, um, whether you were looking at Dylan's later career and um, you know what happens with the persona as he ages and actually returns to some of these former personas. Uh, but you've just explained that you're looking at the 60s. But actually, I don't think the question's irrelevant, because if you're drawing on sources like Todd Haynes' um, film and Dylan's Chronicles and Scorsese's documentary, these are all comparatively recent, uh, what I think of as memory projects, you know, and in later years Dylan's been involved in a lot of these memory projects. Um, you know, even his work as a DJ, where he sort of recasts himself as this curator of American folklore and uh, vernacular culture. Um, and certainly through the, the Todd Haynes film, even though he's not directly involved, he's kind of it's kind of done with his uh, tacit approval. And uh, um, so I just wonder if the way in which this is remembered is also kind of reflecting what you're talking about. So, um, you know, we're a, long, we're a long way removed from that period that you're focused on. And I wonder if you're looking at the kind of maybe distortions and romanticizations that uh, that, that memory aspect can bring, especially in light of that quote we had, I assume it's from my dinner with Andre, is it? Mm -hmm. Wallace Shaw's, but yeah. Um, that kind of romanticization of this moment that was a perfect moment and then it all fell apart and, uh, and what have you. So is that is that part of what you're sort of considering? <clears throat> I, sp I suppose just as a corrective to sort of taking some of this stuff too much, you know, too literally. Like. Yeah. Um, thank mm. you very much for that question. Um, as I've said before, I think you can approach Dylan in so many different ways. If uh, you're interested in literature, you can read plenty of books that uh, dig into the literary influences he has had uh, throughout his whole professional career. But also, I mean, you can listen to the albums and the experience is just your ears. But then you, you also have the chance to approach to Dylan himself um, the movies. And there's lots of movies on Dylan, uh, directed by uh, very famous uh, directors such as Sam Peckinpah, etc. But also Dylan has been in charge of directing his own material, like in Ronaldo and Clara, etc. So I mean, um, there's a whole, there's there's uh, lots of material to uh, to to study and to. Uh, that I think it's quite important if you, if you want to approach to Dylan himself. The fact that, um, well, I was born at the end of the of the 80s, so when I someone asks me, um, uh, the, what's your PhD on? And I say Bob Dylan, they tend to look at me and it's like, but you were born later. And yes, of course, um, uh, that's the beautiful thing about this, that he's been on the road for so long that um, you can find people who's been following Dylan since the 60s and in the 70s or, you know, someone who, like me, come from a later generation. And in that, in that part, the fact that I was born later and you only have, you, you haven't lived this kind of, um, uh, 
don't know, these historical facts on your own because you were not born in there. So the only way you can approach to them is by reading or watching documentaries on the 60s or movies or talking to people who were born in, in, the, in that period and then you create your your own um, yeah your own discourse your mm, own sure your own sure I, I suppose I just mean that there would be a difference wouldn't there between using let's say primary sources from the 50s and 60s mm. um, uh, to, to look at the discourse around at, at that time and um, texts which are predominantly 21st century and it's not mm. thinking about the differences yeah. between those mm. I think more the, the recent material, it's much more focused on um, um, his, um, his image, his identity, I mean, this figure as a myth in popular music, whether if you look at the early movies, he's like, it, it, it's quite different, I think. Um, Ronaldo and Clyde was never understood by critics because it's like uh, it's like tarantula, really. It's like a kind of collage. You have like so many different scenes, and there's not a coherent argument. Let's say, um, in Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, he's only appearing. He has a small. Uh, his he, his role it's uh, very small and very concrete. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, I, I think it's quite different. Maybe the first uh, idea of Roman as you've said, I, I would say um, it's a documentary recorded between in, in Newport Folk Festival between 1963 and 1965 because it's taken in, in the evolution of Bob Dylan. Um, and he started being as a devotee of um, uh, Goody Guthrie and then he turned into the voice of his generation and he's showing you like all this process between one step and the other one. Um, I can relate that documentary much more to the, the, the latest ones, as, as you've said before. And then the others tend to be like more experimental uh, pieces of, uh, of audiovisual pieces of... Uh, yeah. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.